I would say please mute yourself. Uh, questions in the chat as well. Um, the session will be recorded, so it will be put on YouTube, uh, as everybody knows. Uh, so if you don't want your camera on there, uh, please don't put your camera on then and uh, keep on the house rules. I will be your host today and uh, we will be talking about GraphQL on serverless, of course. That's why you're all here. Uh, so let's start the show and the program will look like this. We have a welcome and introduction, just a short talk. What is front-end lightning talks? How does it look like? And who are the speakers? After that, uh, we will do service backend with Firebase from Roy. Then Apollo GraphQL at Rabobank uh, from Ramanoi. And then GraphQL Anywhere or Journey with GraphQL Mesh schema stitching. Um, that will be from Yuri. Uh, we also have a short break in there. So that's also nice for you to know. Uh, that's very important because if you sit for a long time, that's not good. We need your blood flow uh, going. Also for the questions and the water as well. So uh, with not, without further ado, meet the presenters. Uh, this is Roy Brouwer. He will do the first presentation. I uh, put a nice picture of him. Uh, and then we have Ramanui Prasad. Uh, always nice to have you. These are two socialist people. And uh, last but not least, we have Yuri. Uh, that's also great to have him here as well. Nice, yes. Wave to the camera. <laughs> Good on you. Um, and we are very happy that they are willing to present in their own time uh, and willing to share the knowledge with us. But we facilitated this with our own front-end core team uh, from SOCI. This is no recruitment talk. We are just here with a lot of people and like to organize things. We like to think about the people as well. Uh, so we do a lot of things for each other. We try to learn. We work for every big company you can probably name of, uh, which is really cool. And we are all into just summer vibing things. So casual talk, we like that as well. But also test driven development workshops. Uh, for instance, we, each Friday uh, we organize that and uh, come together as a team, so to say. And one of this is also front-end lightning talks, which we really like. And that's why you have some big front-end plans. This is the calendar you see here as well. Uh, we already had some uh, lightning talks, that, which are very nice to have as well. So JavaScript the front-end, uh, CSS, UX, uh, UX accessibility, uh, hybrid and native mobile development. And now GraphQL Cloud and Serverless, of course. Um, so that's really cool. But we try to have different subjects, different speakers from different companies as well. But we keep the same awesomeness. And uh, for next year, we hope to do it again. So if you have any ideas, please contact us. Uh, we want to really keep it open and have a dialogue with each other. Um, so let's see. Um, if we're looking at it right now, I think it's time for of course, no tea, no water, no snack, no break, because we're right going to Roy, and then we'll go to the break. So Roy, you can take over the screen and uh, continue. Welcome, Roy. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, Firebase, and especially Firebase in combination with uh, with Angular. And I'm going to show how to uh, set up uh, an Angular pack, uh, project and connect uh, Firebase uh, to it. Uh, first, a little bit about me. I'm a front-end developer uh, working for Socity. Uh, at this moment, I'm, looking, I'm in a project at uh, KLM, working with Angular, which I uh, yeah, which I really love. I also did a lot with uh, all kind of backend um, um, software, so I, I rather call myself a software developer than uh, than just a front-end developer. Uh, this is me during the night in my uh, my spare time. And a lot of times it happens that I'm ever got, I got an idea, I want to develop a nice uh, nice application. Like, oh yeah, I want to develop, uh, I want to develop this. Just, uh, I, I just learned a new uh, technique uh, in Angular or uh, any kind of uh, any kind of front-end uh, technique. So like, yeah, I'm going to build it. Of course, I choose Angular to do it, but mostly when you build uh, an application like this, you need, uh, yeah, you need some kind of data. So you need a database. Doesn't matter because I'm. Uh, I also have experience with backend development. So yeah, let's start. Uh, yeah, let's build uh, build a database. Then I figure out. Oh, I also needed an API. Okay, no problem. I can build it. That build it too. Uh, I need to store uh, store some files. Okay, can do that too. Uh, after a while, I got uh, a whole backend. I want to share it uh, share it with uh, with other people. So I also need to. Yeah, put it somewhere online on a, on a web server. So I have to install that, 
yeah, configure it, everything. The domain, uh, domain name, secure it, SSL, all kind of stuff. This is all very nice. Oh, and also like, oh, now it's on the web. So I should also secure the data somehow at uh, authentication. Uh, yeah, I can do all of this. It's very nice, but my main goal was to build a small Angular application. I actually don't want to, yeah, I don't have time to all the, to do all this uh, backend work. So the problem is there's not enough time to do all of this. And my solution for this is uh, Firebase. Firebase is a backend as a service. Um, you get a console which uh, connects uh, all the Google uh, Cloud Platform uh, services together. It's serverless, so it's in the cloud. So you don't have any maintenance of infrastructure. Um, you pay per use and it's very, uh, very scalable. Uh, it's a set of services running on the cloud, Google Cloud Platform. Uh, if we go back to my uh, architecture, we can replace all of this with, uh, with Firebase uh, services. Uh, for example, the database, we can replace it by Firestore, which is a NoSQL uh, database. With, this, with that, there comes uh, an, an API by default, with, where you can do simple, um, uh, yeah, simple actions, uh, just uh, create, uh, uh, read, update, delete. If you need more complex stuff, you can uh, use cloud functions for that. Uh, it also contains uh, Firebase storage, where you can store files, and it comes with Firebase hosting, uh, which uh, takes care of all your, uh, your hosting, security, everything that you need uh, yeah, to, put it, uh, to deploy it online. And it comes with Firebase authentication, so you can, uh, uh, which works very nice with uh, the Firestore cloud functions and also the Fire storage, uh, Firebase storage. I can show more of that uh, later on. Yeah, altogether, this is uh, Firebase. Yeah, the pros and cons. Uh, easy integration. It's really easy to uh, implement in your uh, in your project. The downside is the vendor lock-in. Your uh, yeah, you it's uh, it's built by Google, and of course they want to have you as a as a user of it. Um, if you don't, uh, well, you, it's, it, you can uh, prevent it somehow. So you can already uh, from the beginning write it in a way that you can uh, you can move to another supplier if you want. But uh, it is uh, it is more difficult than uh, than if you have your own uh, your own backend, of course. Um, it runs on a NoSQL uh, database which has a high performance, which is really nice. It doesn't matter if you have 10 uh, documents in your collection or 10 million, the speed is, uh, is, is really, really fast. The downside is also NoSQL. You get, it's harder to, uh, to do complex uh, queries, especially if you're used to uh, relational databases. It's hard to, um, yeah, to, it's, for me, for example, I'm used to uh, work with relational databases. And it, took some, it took a long time to, to get used to the modeling in, uh, in NoSQL. There are a lot of nice uh, solutions for that as well, but you have to learn uh, to learn that. Scalability, it's really easy to uh, scale up your uh, your application. And the free tier is very, uh, very generous. It's um, especially for uh, for home projects. It's uh, it's really uh, you never will reach the, the maximum uh, number of uh, free. Um, um, yeah, free usage. And even for small projects, it will be fine. Uh, for larger projects, it can become uh, yeah expensive. Uh, so you should just look into that if you're going to run a big uh, application on it. And there's a large community. So um, if you have any issues, uh, there's a lot of uh, information about it uh, or for, on Stack Overflow, for example. Yeah, I'm going to give a live demo how to uh, yeah how to start uh, a Firebase project and connect it to your uh, Angular uh, application. I'm going to set up an Angular application, set up a Firestore. Um, I built, I'm going to build a small uh, to-do app, very uh, yeah, classic example. And I'm going to secure it with uh, Firebase authentication. And in the end, I'm going to um, yeah, deploy everything with uh, Firebase hosting. Um, yeah, in the preparation, I already installed uh, Angular CLI, which most of you probably already have. And uh, I installed uh, the Firebase CLI which is the Firebase Tools uh, package. Yeah, so let's get started. Um, here you see the Firebase console. We're going to start a new, uh, a new project. I'm going to call it Lightning Talks. Um, yeah, you can uh, enable Google Analytics, but for now we don't, uh, don't need it. So we're going to create it. 
In the same time, I'm gonna create a new Angular project. Uh, don't need any routing. So it's uh, gonna take some time. Yeah, in the same time, uh, Firebase is ready. Yeah, here you see the Firebase uh, console uh, of the project. Uh, and here you see all the, all the servers that you can use. We're gonna start with setting up um, a web app. This is the, the application that we're gonna use to connect to the, to the Angular application. I also already uh, checked that I want to have uh, Firebase uh, hosting later on. So this one's also ready now. Continue. Oh. Okay, we're going to open a project in uh, Visual Studio. Yeah, first thing I'm going to do is gonna, I'm going to uh, put the, the configuration of uh, Firebase in the, in the Angular project. So in here you can find uh, the configuration. This is the configuration that's needed to uh, connect to your uh, uh, to Firebase. And later on we're going to give this, uh, this configuration to the, the Firebase module. Uh, in the same time, oh, I'm going to install, install a couple of uh, npm packages uh, we're going to need. Uh, the first one is um, Angular Fire, which is uh, created by Angular, and we also need the Firebase uh, Firebase package. When this is installed, we can. We're going to add the, the Firebase module to the, to the app uh, module. It doesn't know this import yet, but I'm going to copy paste it. And I already know that we're later on, we're going to use the forms module as well. So I'm already including that one. Oh, and with the Firebase, uh, with the Angular Fire module, uh, we have to uh, to give the configuration with it, which I just uh, added to the environment uh, file. So this should all it uh, takes to uh, to connect it. And I'm going to start building a small application. Oh, and we're going to create the the Firestore database. And all we have to do for that is just creating it. Um, we started in test mode. Uh, it will create a rules file for you, which, uh, which uh, takes care of the authentication. For now, it's accessible for everybody. But later on, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to secure this so it's not uh, accessible anymore. Uh, I'll should select the European server. Um, now I'm going to create a couple of components. Uh, no, the first one is going to be a form. And I will create uh, a small model. Uh, this is not necessary, but it uh, will help you to um, uh, to make sure that the um, yeah that you make less uh, less mistakes. Uh, it's easier to uh, yeah it's easier to develop, to maintain, and also to uh, to debug. Oh, uh, make a typo. Oh, I missed one. Yeah, so now we've got the first uh, component. In this component, I'm going to add um, a to-do item to the list. For that, I need uh, some input, uh, which is a title. 
and I'm gonna need gonna need a submit function, which is gonna send the uh, yeah send the data to the Firebase uh, to the Firestore database. Write that here in there. Somehow my import is not working, so I'm copying it the first time. I think that's to do with my Visual Studio, but um, this is the one we need. I'm going to create a to-do of the type uh, to-do. And the only thing we need to send this to the to Firestore is just uh, selecting the collection, which is not there yet, but it will create it when it's uh, when it doesn't exist yet. And do that, and to make sure that the format is uh, is right and always in the same uh, in the same format, I will also add the interface so it knows uh, which how it should uh, should look. And of course, then I need a form also to. Uh, Send the data. And a button to uh, submit the whole uh, the whole thing. Now, now let's hope it uh, it all works. Uh, the cool thing about uh, Firebase is when you um, this database is, uh, is real time, and at the moment that we will uh, submit something in um, in the application, you will also see it uh, directly in uh, in there. Uh, take some time to uh, to serve it the first time. Yeah, in the meanwhile, we already uh, set up the authentication. Uh, you got a lot of uh, different kinds of uh, authentication. So you can cho also choose to connect to Google, Facebook, all kinds of um, uh, single sign-ons. For now, I'm just going to enable the email password for this uh, for this demo. And I'm going to add my own, uh, well, I'm going to add a uh, test uh, email address and password. Yeah, this one's ready. Oh yeah, and of course I have to uh, add the the component I just created to the to the app component. So now we see the form. If I add something here, oh, it should go to the in the in the into the database. You see the data is uh, is already there. To make it a little bit nicer, I will clear the, the title when it's uh, submitted. And it should also uh, pop up here. Well, mostly it's faster. Uh, there it is. And uh, of course, we also want to see it, uh, we'll see the data in the application. Uh, so, first thing I'm going to do is uh, add to do uh, component. All I'm going to do in there is just uh, display the data of one uh, one to do. So I'm expecting it as an as an input. And I'm sure it's uh, going to be here. Yeah, the, the receive uh, receiving of the data is gonna 
that's going to take uh, place in the app component. In this case, of course, normally you would uh, not do it here, but just for the demo I'm going to use, I can do it here. Normally you would also write uh, a service to uh, to do this, but uh, yeah, we don't have time for that today. So again, I'm going to uh, get the, the Firestore uh, Firestore module. And receive it from the to-do collection. Um, with the function value changes. Uh, this value changes uh, function and um, uh, takes care of you that you will get uh, updates uh, all the time when, you, when the data will be uh, will be updated. So at the moment when there will be new uh, items in the database, it will be automatically be uh, be called against. So it's observable uh, in the application. Then, oh, I'm gonna get the to-do component. And I'm going to fill it with the data that we uh, get from the app component. That should be there. Oh, sorry, I'm in the wrong, uh, in the wrong one. I should be here. And pass the to-do item with it. Okay, that's the downside of the of live coding. Oh, I didn't save it. Okay, so now we see the um, we see the items, and we have another item here. Uh, it will uh, automatically be here. Uh, there's no connection between the the form that we created and the the list, uh, but just because it's uh, sending it to the database and this one's getting an update from the database directly, it's uh, it's automatically updated uh, already. Um, now we're going to secure the, the database. We can do it here in the rules uh, in the rules file. In this file, you can write um, for each document. Uh, you can write uh, the the uh, what kind of uh, permissions there are uh, for it. So now it says that everybody can uh, can read and write uh, on every document uh, until the, as long as the time is uh, yeah it's uh, small uh, smaller than uh, the 9th of September. Of course, we don't want to do that. We want to have. Uh, we want only want to do it for aut authenticated uh, users. So we're just going to put there that uh, uh, we, everybody can uh, read and write who is uh, authenticated. Uh, you can also uh, maintain this file in a file in your project, uh, so it will be uh, yeah in your in your version control, and then you can um, you can deploy it with uh, the Firebase tools as well. Uh, but now for the demo, I just uh, do it here because it's. Uh, Easier and quicker. So when we go back to the uh, to the application, if we reload the application now, we will see that um, yeah, there's no uh, we don't have permissions for the for this uh, yeah to access this database. So we're going to add um, a login, and we're going to do this by uh, first by adding um, the authentication uh, service. And of course, it's not importing it again. So I'm going to copy paste that. Um, yeah, normally it should uh, autocomplete this, but it's. Uh, I think it has to do with the second settings of my uh, Visual Studio. Uh, here I'm going to create uh, going to create a, an odd state uh, observable. Which tells if uh, somebody is uh, uh, logged in or not. And 
any of the templates, uh, I'm going to check uh, check that. Oh, and first I'm going to create uh, a login uh, component. Just like this, and we're gonna make uh, an ng template to show the to show the login if somebody is not uh, is not logged in. So login. Uh, so we expect to uh, yeah to see the the login works uh, text, which is coming from the from the login, login component. Um, and here we're going to uh, to make the user login with the user with an email and a password. Login function, which is uh, yeah, going to log it in. Again, we need the the authentication uh, service. And with this, we can just say, um, yeah, I want to sign in with uh, email and password. I'm going to use this. Uh, this email and password, and to show what you get if it's uh, incorrect, I will catch the, the error to uh, to show you. And of course, we're going to need a login uh, form for that. So we can put in the email and the passwords and a submit button to uh, to submit it to the form. Just like this. Now the form should uh, show up. Yeah. So if you now log in without um, anything, you will get um, uh, an error that uh, the, the email is uh, is incorrect. If you put the right uh, the right email without a password, you will get uh, password is wrong. And if you log in with the right uh, credentials, you uh, yeah you're logged in. And um, yeah, so this is how easy it is to um, to add authentication. Then the last step to, um, um, and this we want to, yeah, we want to deploy this to um, to the web. So we're going to um, use the Firebase tools for that. Uh, all we need to do is, uh, oh, go to and say Firebase init. It will ask you which um, which services you want you want to go to use. I only want to use uh, hosting for now. And I'm going to use uh, an existing project. Because it's already uh, it's already there. So the lightning talks uh, project. Um, in the same time, I'm going to build the to build the project just with uh, the ng build. And um, yeah, the Firebase um, tools want to know what's uh, where the build uh, will uh, will be located. So that should be in the dist. Uh, Lightning talks. Uh, yes, we want to do that. And no. So now it's uh, set up. And uh, now we just have to wait till the the build is uh, ready, which will uh, yeah will take some time for the first time.
But yeah, now it's done. And all we have to do now is say uh, Firebase deploy. It will be uh, the first time it takes a bit longer uh, because it has to. Uh, oh, it's already done. Oh no, it's, uh, it's not done yet. <laughs> uh, the first time it takes a bit longer. Um, if you do it for a second or third time, it's uh, it's much much faster. Uh, here you get an, a URL where it's um, uh, where it's uh, deployed. If we go there, we will see the the application again. And in here, we will have the same uh, same application. And here you can also see how fast it is when you uh, when you add something. If we add something here now, you'll see it uh, directly um, showing up at uh, in the other application as well. So it's also it can also be used for uh, jet uh, applications stuff like that because it's all uh, it's all real time. So this was the this was the demo. Uh, we'll now continue in the presentation. Um, yeah, there's much more to tell uh, about Firebase. Um, yeah, I think my time is uh, running out, so I cannot tell that much anymore. But uh, I can yeah can talk for hours about it. Uh, the cloud functions. Now we just saw some simple, um, some very simple functions just to uh, to receive data, put data in there. Uh, also updating data. So you can do that just with uh, with one line of uh, code. Um, if, you, uh, if you're getting to the point that you need more complex uh, API functions, you can use uh, cloud functions for that. Um, it's all JavaScript and TypeScript. So the downside is that you cannot use uh, other languages, but it's uh, very easy to use. And it's also very easy to, to, uh, to use the authentication of the database in there. Uh, cloud storage, yeah, same story. If you need to store files just with one line of code, uh, you, can, uh, you can store them. And you can use authentication again to uh, to uh, to tell who can uh, access which files. Yeah, there are also a lot of pitfalls uh, in Firebase, uh, especially with uh, the pricing. Uh, you should be careful because uh, if you make a technical um, a technical mistake, which uh, causes a lot of requests uh, to the server, for example, uh, you can end up with uh, huge bills by uh, by Google. Uh, you can. Um, Prevent this by uh, by setting uh, a budget. So you can say like, yeah, I, I don't want to spend more than uh, uh, five euros a month on it, and then you will get uh, warnings when you uh, when you get close to that uh, to the budget. But uh, when it the budget is a little bit uh, uh, behind in time, it's not real time. So it might happen if you if you get yeah extremely unlucky and you're really bad at coding that you might uh, end up with. Um, um, yeah, that, that the function is called so many times that it's going too fast for the budget even to warn you uh, in time. So you, you can still end up with uh, things, but um, there's a lot of information about find to find about it. More information, uh, the documentation, of course. Firebase itself has uh, really good uh, documentation. Their official YouTube channel uh, contains a lot of uh, instruction videos about uh, how to set up things. Uh, a lot about modeling of uh, of NoSQL uh, databases, which is uh, very useful, and Fireship.io, which also offers a lot of uh, video material with um, yeah useful tutorials about uh, Firebase. That's it for now. Um, are there any questions? Thank you, Doi. Very well done. I think it's nice if we uh, applaud him uh, with our cool emoticons, <laughs> because if we unmute ourselves, then it will be uh, a loud noise for everybody. So well done, Roy. Uh, there are a few questions, yeah. Uh, the public is going wild, so that's great. Uh, the first question uh, is basically, could you please also share the source code? Um, yeah, sure. Do you think it's possible? Nice, great. I think we'll uh, share that within the meetup. Uh -huh. uh, in the meetup page, so that's cool. It's, uh, by the way, amazing to see how fast you can set up a backend like this and really real time, that's cool. <laughs> um, there are also some comments on live coding as well. Interesting, uh, everybody uh, thinks you're the live coding god, so that's cool to see yeah. as well. <laughs> well, good to hear, um, you like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, another question uh, from Emil. In uh, this setup, will users see all to-dos or only their own? Uh, in this setup, they will see all to-dos, um, but um, of course, it's really easy to to uh, solve by adding a field with uh, with the, um, the user ID and and use it in the selection uh, for it. Um, and also about the, uh, the authentication. Uh, in the file that I showed, where you have uh, this, um, uh, where I now secured it just uh, 
so it's available for everybody that's logged in. You can also use uh, the ID of the user, for example. So you can say like uh, you can only uh, receive uh, documents from the database where the user ID uh, is equal to the ID that's in the in the document. So the user ID in the document. So you can use uh, and you can also you can even look up uh, into the database in the in that rule uh, rules file. So you can uh, make very complex uh, authentication uh, rules in there. So that's. Uh, so that will be a nice for a nice uh, feature for this uh, to-do list. Yeah. <laughs> nice, great to hear. Um, there's another question. Uh, do you think Firebase is a chance in enterprise companies, or is it more focused on the smaller use cases? Um, yeah, personally, I would only go for the smaller use cases. Um, I think it should be also uh, be used. Uh, yeah, you should uh, be able to use it in uh, big enterprise applications, but. I have no experience with it, and for sure, if I would uh, use it for uh, for customers in a big enterprise, I would uh, team up with yeah with people who are we have yeah much more experience in uh, in Firebase. Uh, personally, I use it uh, mainly for small projects, uh, and especially for to do, to make a nice uh, prototype or some uh, yeah fast uh, fast development. Uh, but for small startups and uh, small applications, it's uh, def yeah definitely uh, very useful. Nice, great to hear. Uh, another question from Mani Pradeep, if I pronounced it correctly. Uh, is there a possibility not to store the Firebase credentials in the Angular source code? I hope there is. <laughs> I think so. Um, I don't think there is. <laughs> oh, okay. to, uh, but it's uh, the, the credentials you use. It's only the the, the connection to the to the Firebase database. So that's uh, uh, to the Firestore database. So it's not um, uh, if you're uh, for everything where you need real uh, credentials for, you, you, you should use uh, cloud functions to uh, to secure it. But that's um, yeah, that's that topic is too big to uh, go deeper into that now. <laughs> nice, right? And there's also another nice comment. There is a Firebase app in Java SDK. So uh, for everybody interested, they can look into that as well. Yeah, yeah. There's SDK in in many languages. So that's. Uh, yeah, so you can, you can uh, use them on, on a lot of. Uh, I think it's it's also used a lot on uh, on Android and uh, and, I, and uh, iOS. So that's um, yeah, they have uh, uh, SDKs for uh, all popular languages. Yeah. Nice, great, um, great to see. Thank you, uh, Roy. I uh, will take it over from now, and we'll go to the short break. Uh, so that's nice as well for everybody. Uh, stretch your legs, I would say, uh, get something to drink, and I think we will start within uh, five minutes, so that will be, uh, well, exactly on time, actually, <laughs> quarter before eight, so that's great. Um, yeah, I will see you within five or six minutes. If you have any questions uh, until then, you can always put them in the chat and we'll uh, answer them. That's no problem, or unmute yourself if you want to stay and chat for a bit. That's also good. Um, that will start within five minutes. Thank you, Roy, for the first presentation. Thanks. All right, there's some nice links to share. <laughs> Coffee at 8 p.m. <laughs> oh, working till 3 p.m. or a.m. <laughs> that, I guess. Yeah, code and recording will be shared, of course. Uh, recording, uh, yeah. Uh, well, we can do that, actually, the code source uh, on YouTube. I think that's possible. But uh, first look at the meetup page. There will we also uh, mail you about the recording as well. That will be fine. And I see there's a nice link about environment configuration. Always good. <laughs> oh, I'm getting something to drink as well. So see you soon. We zijn lekker bezig, Christian. Thanks.
Already Ramanui. Yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Great. We are as well. <laughs> If you want, uh, Ravano, you can already start sharing your screen. Uh, that's no yep. problem. Then you're all prepared <laughs> because we know we'll start with you. <laughs> OK. And then, then we'll just wait a few seconds then because we'll start in one minute. I think I'm sharing my screen now, right? Yes, yes, yes. I can uh, see your PowerPoint already, so that's great. Uh, now let's wait for a few uh, seconds. I will spotlight you and then we can start. You should do like a countdown. Yeah, <laughs> yeah countdown meter. Well, I can do a countdown like this. Five, four, three, two, one, and we'll go. <laughs> so it's, it's quarter before eight, so I think that's a good countdown. Next time uh, we'll improve on that, yeah, or maybe some lift music as well. Um, welcome everybody again. Uh, I hope you're here and having a drink. At least uh, I'm having a good time as well. So uh, we will continue with uh, Ramon <coughs> Apollo Graphiel at the Rabobank. I think you will present something <coughs> really cool. Uh, so Ramon, the floor is yours, man. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I hope you can see my screen. Uh, my name is Ramon, and today I'm going to uh, talk about uh, Apollo GraphQL and uh, how we basically use in uh, Rabobank. Uh, I'm not going to talk uh, about the whole Rao Bank, but mainly about the, the insurance domain where I, I work. So, uh, so who am I? Uh, as I said, I'm, my name is Ramon Prasad and uh, uh, working in Rao Bank as a uh, front end developer uh, through Sojiti. Uh, I have more than nine years of development experience in uh, front end, and I'm basically uh, from India and living in the Netherlands uh, since. Uh, 2016. So that's that's about me. Uh, so the agenda is to first talk about how was the previous solution designed, and uh, then I'll also go through uh, how we uh, how did we implement it in a new architecture. So uh, let's start with the previous solution. Uh, <clears throat> it was a backend driven. So uh, it means the customer journey uh, was driven by uh, completely backend, uh, which means uh, all the data were coming from backends. Uh, for example, if you have to call on a link, uh, the link was coming from uh, backend. Uh, also, most of the functional logics were basically written in a backend. So that was the one thing. Uh, then it was tightly coupled. Uh, our front-end application was uh, tightly coupled with the backend. Uh, this means uh, changing uh, uh, in one place, uh, I mean, changing the code in one place or moving the code uh, from one to other place would require a lot of testing efforts. So it was uh, like, uh, as I said, tightly coupled. Uh, testing was much more complicated. Uh, like if you change something, then it, it had to, like you had to do a lot of testing. Uh, yeah, uh, which was really not an easy task uh, considering um, more than 17 ins insurance applications. So it's not one, it's like more than 17 insurance applications. So you have to do a lot of uh, testing, so not really easy te testing things. Um, then it was a uh, slowness. Uh, as I said, since it was backend driven, there are a lot of uh, calls were made, uh, basically a lot of HTTP calls were made to the backend. So this was basically requires uh, uh, lots of, uh, uh, or, I mean, the application was quite, quite slow because of that. And then, uh, old tech stack. Uh, the front end application was uh, mainly built uh, on AngularJS, and uh, it was uh, on uh, it was kind of micro uh, micro front end projects. So every application had uh, their own uh, repository and their separate Jenkins pipeline. So maintaining these were quite difficult. 
So how we implemented. So this is uh, how our new solutions uh, look like now. Um, our backend team uh, basically were creating uh, microservices uh, for every uh, insurance uh, actions. Uh, that is something like flow wise. Uh, earlier we had uh, insurance uh, specific uh, endpoints. So uh, backend, uh, backend team thought, let's create uh, the feature specific uh, endpoints. And uh, and we also had, uh, since we, were, see we had a single uh, source of truth in our backend, we also uh, wanted to only get the data which we need uh, from the backend, not, not everything. So we, we created middleware uh, with a GraphQL. And uh, another thing was uh, that uh, the bank was strategy was to also bring everything on uh, Angular 7 at that time uh, with a new architecture. So we decided to also recreate the front end. So the middleware part and the front end parts, almost everything recreated. So now we have one single endpoint, uh, that is we say Google uh, GraphQL endpoint, uh, which we call from our uh, front end. And mi then middleware has to decide uh, how many calls to, uh, I mean, it has to decide uh, which service to call, how many service to call based on the schema or the query uh, which we pass. Uh, in new architecture, we also use Azure pipelines features, uh, Azure features basically not a repository pipelines, it's releases, compliances, uh, artifacts, and so a lot of things from Azure. And uh, uh, basically Azure pipeline generates all those artifacts and at the end that gets deployed to the PCF. So that's how it is in a new architecture. We chose Graph, uh, Apollo GraphQL. Uh, yeah, so uh, why? So based on the research at that time, uh, we figured out that uh, Apollo GraphQL uh, I mean, Apollo Server and Apollo Client all are the best uh, tool at the, in the market. And the main benefit was that uh, we had to deal with one single language throughout, that is TypeScript. So that's the only reason. Uh, the, of course, there could be some more reason, but that was the main reason for us to uh, go with Apollo GraphQL. So, okay, so before uh, before we uh, proceed further, first let's try to understand, because we are talking about the GraphQL, let's try to understand uh, GraphQL in nutshell. <clears throat> so, uh, as uh, we know, uh, GraphQL is a query language uh, for the API. So that allow you to ask uh, uh, different types of data, uh, basically in one go. Uh, that is very briefly uh, what it is for and why it is awesome. Uh, I have taken example here uh, uh, from uh, <clears throat> from GraphQL uh, website. <clears throat> so as you see, uh, it tried to uh, it tried to cre uh, uh, query title and uh, opening crawl, uh, and also trying to uh, query rating field, uh, but the rating field doesn't exist on uh, type uh, film, so it throws an error while uh, typing itself. So that's quite sometimes handy when uh, somehow if you are mistyped or asking for data which is not a part of your schema. Uh, but uh, the title field and uh, and the opening crawl field was available. So <clears throat> the, the request is all the way sent to the backend, and then backend knows what data it is querying for, and backend will respond to you with that uh, with the title and opening crawl value, and it does not it does not respond with any other data. So you asked for two data, and you only get the response for those two uh, fields. So. Uh, and, it, I, I, and you also see like there is an, it generates a nice document. Uh, uh, so if you want to uh, check the types of a field, uh, you can just click through and then it's, it's quite handy. Uh, in a classical way, uh, when you ask for a data from a server, you get all the data uh, which server has, uh, even though you do not need uh, uh, for your front-end applications. So that is uh, that is how, uh, that is what about the GraphQL on that cell. Let's move ahead about the GraphQL uh, middleware. Uh, so, so what we did, we created a middleware, and what middleware is? Middleware is basically a server, and that runs on the no node and, uh, and and our backend uh, application that is uh, uh, microservices. So it it's, it's, it lies between the uh, front end and the back end, the the middleware part. Um, we call uh, a single endpoint every time from our front end uh, and query the data what we need. Uh, we do not uh, need to basically think where the data is coming from, uh, I mean the front end. So 
whether it is coming from uh, this service or it is coming from another service, we just ask uh, uh, or send the query to the middleware, uh, the data which we need, and uh, uh, and uh, what we and then we get the answers. And basically, middleware has to aggregate the data from different microservices that are available. Uh, so that's about uh, uh, this. And then what we use in the middleware is uh, um, graphical module. Um, Basically, graphical model. Why we use because it it helps to create uh, easily maintainable, uh, reusable, and then uh, testable, um, yeah, ex extendable modules. So the basic concept being the graphical model is to separate your GraphQL uh, server into smaller and independent uh, feature-wise modules. That's that's how you can see also in the in the diagram. And uh, yeah, so basically the, this graphical model uh, library helps to organize your schema. Uh, types and uh, their associated resolvers into the multiple modules uh, uh, or uh, files or anything related to a specific part of your uh, app under a module. So, yeah, that's that's about the graphical module, and that's how uh, uh, since it and since we also deal uh, with large uh, applications, we decided to use this cool feature uh, in our middleware. Uh, this is how the GraphQL. So inside the GraphQL, we uh, uh, we also have. Uh, I mean, we use uh, services. We write services. We write uh, sorry. We write schema. We write services, resolvers, and then specs. I will also go through uh, uh, one by one um, uh, uh, during this uh, presentation. Uh, due to the compliance issue, uh, I cannot show you the actual code, uh, but. Uh, these are basically uh, some examples code to uh, explain you better how we create those thing, those uh, specific uh, things. So this is one. Uh, this is how we create the graphical modules. Uh, and uh, uh, this is about the types, uh, the schema part. So this is how we uh, create the schema. As you see, I've created the schema product types uh, using, the, of course, the graphical module, uh, and then. Uh, in this schema, we pass is a product. We pass the ID, um, and then you have you have the, the output. I mean, you you are expecting title, a thumbnail, category rating. So you need to define your types and the schema. Uh, if you notice here, we have used the exclamation mark. Uh, that is uh, that is just to uh, make sure it's, it's it is a kind of guarantee that it is always there. Otherwise, it can be nullable. So, for example. Uh, if any GraphQL, uh, I mean, if the query, if you query a field and data is not available, not available, in that case you might get null. So when you make this uh, uh, symbol uh, exclamation mark, then it is a kind of guaranteed that you get, you're going to get this data. Uh, so that's how uh, that's about this. And then we use uh, this is just normal service uh, where we basically configure our um, uh, microservices endpoints. Uh, then we have resolvers. Uh, so let's uh, first try to understand what this resolver is. So basically, a resolver is a function uh, that uh, resolves a value or for a type or a field inside a schema. Uh, in this example, um, I want, for example, a query. I want to query for, uh, number six uh, because I always need a fixed di fixed digit number six. We can write this kind of logic in the inside a resolver. But just to explain this legible part, but uh, also while returning the data from the microservice, if you want to do some kind of manipulation in, in the between, so between the uh, microservice and front end, if you want to do some kind of manipulations, that logic you can write inside a resolver. We also write specs. So in our middleware, we have created the specs, uh, something something like this. Not uh, yeah. So what it does, uh, um, uh, we basically. We, we do a snapshot testing. So uh, when we run this query and mutations against our stub uh, service, uh, and then it creates a snapshot from the backend. And uh, we have also created an integration test case using that. So uh, when you uh, when the build runs, uh, integration test case also runs, and it verify, verifies that uh, the query results are basically matching with your generated snapshot. So we, it's another layer kind of testings. In our uh, uh, for middleware queries, so that's about the uh, GraphQL middleware part. So I just showed you uh, you the middleware part, uh, middleware side, and this is the front end side. 
In the front end, uh, we have Apollo CodeGen uh, along with the TypeScript Apollo Angular. We uh, use Apollo uh, client caching and we use Apollo client, uh, client state management. And I'm going to explain you a little bit uh, to understand uh, how we uh, use that. Uh, to, uh, so let's start with uh, uh, Apollo uh, CodeGen. So what Apollo CodeGen is, does, it generates TypeScript types for any query and mutations written in your Apollo client project. Uh, of course, you have to make sure that you have given a valid uh, graphical schema. Uh, if you see in this example, I have uh, on the left side, I have get product. So this is how we uh, write the, pro uh, the, uh, the graphical file names. And uh, when you query these products, like uh, so we have a query in the left side. Uh, when you query this, uh, so this is the query. And when you run the code gen, then these are the types it generates. Uh, for your, uh, so that is what the code gen does. Uh, apart, so that is, and then we, along with the code gen, we also use uh, TypeScript Apollo Angular plugin. So in the configuration file, we have also configured this uh, TypeScript Apollo Angular plugin. And this uh, plugin basically generates Angular services with the TypeScript typing. And it basically generates a strongly typed Angular service for every defined uh, query or mutations or subscriptions. And uh, yeah, so we use this uh, Apollo Angular plugin because our front end is, is uh, using Angular. So, and we need those types. So, uh, yeah, so uh, what we do, we make our uh, middleware service running uh, so that it takes the query from our front end and run against the middleware to, to generate uh, these types and also uh, those services. Uh, so, uh, you have here the types, uh, which is basically tied uh, to your middleware. So. Uh, that's why uh, we turn the middle, uh, uh, middle with that. And this gives you basically an extra layer of uh, kind of security, you say, or you say trust that because your your types are tied with your front end and back end. So it gives you an extra layer of uh, kind of trust that it is going to work. Um, if you see uh, this Angular services, uh, these are very small, uh, very simple Angular services. It does not do whole a lot. It has basically it extends the Apollo query, and uh, yeah, and it has some. It has basically the document, but these uh, documents are basically same as uh, the the query. But the the main thing is that it creates injectable. Uh, you see, it, it makes injectable, uh, which means that you can use this uh, service like a normal service, normal Angular service in your component. So, uh, so. How we use them. So um, the left side, you see, this is how we uh, maintain our folder structure. We keep our GraphQL file along with the the components. So if you see this product dot component, uh, GraphQL is along with the components, just for uh, easy maintenance, easy maintenance and understanding. Um, as I mentioned uh, be before, also due to the compliance issue, I cannot show you the actual code. These are just example codes to make you understand uh, these things. Uh, on the right side, what you see is uh, we import uh, the generated service uh, from the uh, this code, so code gen output files. So uh, this get product query or get product uh, um, GQL, these two we import from the um, generated files. And, uh, and we are using in our constructor, as you see, uh, as a kind of a normal service uh, we uh, injected uh, here. And then, uh, uh, yeah, so if you see, I have also used the fetch method here. This is just one way to basically get the data from your uh, middleware. A nice thing is that it always returns an observable. So, so you can pipe uh, uh, and do what uh, we want to do with the data within the sprint. So since it is it is observable, you can do all those uh, RxJS uh, magics. Um, and as you see, uh, this response type uh, is also using one of the type uh, generated uh, by the code gen file. So you are making type shape, and that's how uh, we use uh, uh, this Apollo code gen uh, along with the uh, Angular Apollo. Then we have a uh, uh, caching. Uh, we use Apollo client caching. Uh, what actually Apollo client caching does is uh, uh, it stores the result of your GraphQL uh, queries uh, in, in your local uh, normalized in-memory cache. This means that 
uh, everything uh, you are going to query or uh, 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 with a GraphQL or and coming from the middleware will be added to your cache. And I have uh, just an example to show you how basically the cache looks like. I've used here a plugin that is a uh, it's a Apollo client dev tool extension in the Chrome you can use to just to show you like how the cache looks like. And uh, what it does like basically Apollo, uh, so it, it stores the data with a reference. So it, it stores the data with a reference at, uh, to your to the ID automatically. And um, the main thing is that this is done by Apollo. Uh, this is completely managed by, uh, by Apollo. So you don't have to basically worry about whole a lot. And this is just a clear benefits uh, with using the Apollo uh, cache. And whenever uh, we run a query for an uh, endpoint, it first checks whether uh, it exists in, our, in the cache. And if it is found, then it will result the data from the cache. But if uh, it is not found, then it will try to query the data from the remote through the middleware. And then response will be first add to the cache and then come to the browser. And this is also we call as uh, uh, cache first uh, fetch policy. Uh, which is basically a default fetch policy uh, in Apollo. Um, there are, of course, uh, some cases where you do not want to use your cache, uh, you, or you, you want to use a different, or you want to use the cache, but different ways. So there, uh, that's why th there are different kinds of fetch policies to uh, handle that. And these uh, fetch policies are basically uh, you can configure based on your need. Uh, we just saw before uh, in the slides we saw a fetch function to get the data from uh, uh, from the, using the GraphQL uh, service. This is uh, just an option you can give to that fetch function. So yeah, so that's about uh, this um, caching. I mean, as I said, we don't write any separate services to manage the cache. It's, it's completely handled through that. Then we also do uh, state management. Another cool thing is that we do the state management, and the reason we do state management in the GraphQL is we want one way to get the data, uh, no matters where the data is located. And we have uh, uh, why because we have many we have many multi-step form in our project, and every step uh, does not have a service call to the backend, but we do need to store the data uh, when the customer navigates from back to forth, and. Uh, it does, and it doesn't need to basically query uh, uh, to the backend. So uh, it's just the local state, uh, but we use the GraphQL for this as well. And that allow you, that allow us to have it accessible exactly the same way, uh, same way as other data. So there is a single way to access the data, and that is why we use this state management uh, thingy in a uh, GraphQL. Uh, as I said, we can combine the local field one, uh, only uh, local field along with a remote query. So if you see this example below, uh, we have combined, uh, if you see in this example, name and price are something going to come from remote and each uh, int uh, uh, card is uh, a local only fields. It's not going to, uh, so this add to client is just to tell that it should never go to the middleware for this specific field. In this way, it is, it is a little bit the same way as kind of cash only policy in the of a fetch policy. But the main difference is that it is a part of your query. So you would define directly at, at the query level. So this is how uh, we write uh, each step uh, to the state. And uh, yeah, we have a very simple way to manage the local state and uh, uh, same way to also manage the remote, remote data. So we have single query you, with the query, you also manage the state, local state and also the remote state. So, any question? Oh, <laughs> the one the timing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> great, great <Okay>. timing. <laughs> nice. Uh, well, in that case, well done. I think we are very happy with your presentation as well. Uh, just like with Roy, I think it's very nice if we applaud him with the emoticons. Uh, that would be really nice for him as well, uh, since we cannot do this live. Well done. Uh, yes, there are a few questions, Ramanoi. But yeah. uh, first, I want to say it's very cool to have an uh, insight into the architecture of Rabobank and a small overview as well yeah. to uh, see it like this. Not the real code, but that's no problem. I get the point, so that's good. Um, the first question, here it comes, uh, is from Tom Cool. Nice name, by the way, Tom Cool. 
Uh, if your team goes for a, a GraphQL strategy, what would be the approach to build your API endpoints? And in what way does it differ from REST? Yeah, so if you would have seen uh, the, the, the example, so let me first uh, answer uh, the second part first. So when you, it differs from REST because when you, uh, for example, when you ask for uh, or when you, when you query or when you send uh, or you, you get you ask for data, you get everything what a survey. For example, example of an employee service, and employee service has employee name, employee ID, employee address, and all the things. Uh, and you, in your application form, you only want to show employee name. You don't call, you don't want to show anything related to his address or ID anything. You just need name. But when you call the rest. The service will respond you all the data. It's not going to filter. It's giving every data, and in the front end, you have to basically do all the logic to only show the names. But you all get, you always get all the data. But with the GraphQL, this is this is something. What you ask, you only get that. So if you ask for name, now middleware has to decide uh, and has to basically it has to query what data you have asked from the front end, and you get that. So that's that's clear benefit. You you basically deal with the list amount of data, so your performance will be better. Uh, first part uh, was about, can, can you repeat the first part? part of the sure, question? I can repeat the first part, that's no problem. I will scroll back to the question. <laughs> um, there are a few more questions for you as well, so that's uh, no problem. Uh, let's see, if your team goes for a GraphQL strategy, what would be the approach to build your API endpoints? Yeah, so uh, as I said in the beginning, like when our team started building uh, these microservices, uh, uh, we ha we also had, so before that, like all our endpoints were like insurance, insurance specific. So like example, for auto insurance, there was a separate uh, endpoint for uh, 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 like home insurance, there are separate endpoints. So they thought, why can't, uh, why can't we make it feature specific? Like for example, because uh, for example, inventory. So in case of inventory and home, they are always going to call address service, for example. So why can't I make one address service which can be used by both the insurance? So it's better to organize your uh, uh, backend based on the flow wise when you are going to build a GraphQL or let's say going to set the microservices. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, another question is, do you have any reason to choose Apollo instead of going open source for GraphQL tools? Um, maybe I think you will <laughs> answer that as well yeah, uh, within so, a few seconds. So, yeah, so I think sure. yeah, I think I already answered that question. Uh, as I said, when we were doing the research, uh, because we also do ha had to do a lot of research uh, to which tool to use. And uh, as I said, we wanted to deal with one language uh, and it was TypeScript. So our Angular application is in TypeScript, our middleware is in TypeScript. So we wanted to have one language throughout. And as I said, Apollo had a lot to offer, like Apollo server and Apollo client had a lot to offer. And that's the reason, because of one language and a lot of advantages, we, used, we went for the Apollo, Apollo GraphQL and Apollo client. Nice, great to hear. And the last question, I'm sorry we're running a bit out of time, but this is the last question for you, uh, Ramanui. Uh, does GraphQL have a language agnostic spec for generating client code like OpenAPI for REST? Uh, I think uh, I, I, I have to look into that. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. We can answer that uh, after yeah. the session. Yeah. Uh, cool. Thank you. Um, I will give you the word to Yuri right now. Maybe Yuri, you want to start with the question. Uh, we had. <laughs> <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you perfectly. Thank you, Ramanoi, right. and uh, welcome, Yuri, to the Lightning Talks. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you, Ramanoi. It was really exciting to hear uh, about GraphQL in uh, in Rabobank. Um, I was, we were. Uh, ago and trying to convince them to use GraphQL, and they were busy with other stuff, so they didn't think it was make sense. And it's nice to see that now. Uh, uh, yeah. You're using it, so it's very exciting. Uh, yeah, nice, nice to hear. Very nice. Thanks. Um, yeah, so you want me to start with questions? I can. Uh, yes, with the um, question of uh, Guillermo Reis, do you have any reason to choose Apollo instead of going open source for GraphQL tools? Well, uh, so I um, I used to work at Apollo when we started Apollo, and then uh, I started the guild, and now we are the ones building the GraphQL tools library. And also other things. I would just say Apollo is also open source. Uh, 
Um, so it's not like uh, Apollo is not open source, um, but they do tend to have like their own. Um, so at least when we started, we were kind of the leaders in Apollo, like, like to do the open source and be the first and Apollo is definitely the most popular. So if you want to like, I would say go with the safest bet with like where all the community is, Apollo client and Apollo server is probably, you know, very safe choices. I would say personally that I think um, in the last few years, they're not investing so much in open source as they were. Uh, and now both on the client and on the server, they're starting to be a better, more modern alternatives that are more well-maintained. Um, but all the all of these options are are great. Like you can't like really fail with Apollo and you can't really fail with others. So, I mean, I think a couple of years ago, the community was lacking tools and many libraries and now it's the opposite. Like right? there's tons of stuff and it's all well maintained. So it's much easier to, if you started like GraphQL two years ago or three years ago, today's should be much easier ride uh, than, than then. Yeah, mm. I, I agree with you, yes, correct. <laughs> <laughs> nice, great here. Very cool. All right, you read the floor is yours. We have GraphQL anywhere, so you can share. Yeah, well, uh, the, 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 all the answers are, are answered. I mean, I can uh, I can answer yeah. more for now. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's first in the presentation, then we can okay, do, okay, okay. Uh, do, the, uh, do two questions. <laughs> uh, okay, sure. So uh, I can answer them uh, for hours. <laughs> that's true. Uh, wait, let me. Let me know, just a second. Let me know when you see me. This is our website. Um, and what we do, like I said at the beginning, I used to work at Apollo uh, when we actually started Apollo. Uh, it used to be a company called Meteor and we built Meteor JS. It was a full stack framework, uh, which was very interesting. And I can talk about that for a many, for a long, very long, but, um, but it turned into Apollo at some point. So I was a part of the team that turned into Apollo for many reasons. And then I s decided to go and uh, create the guild for all kinds of reasons. I thought that um, there might be a different way to do open source that is more sustainable and more high quality than how I experienced it before. Um, and we were very much focused on GraphQL at the beginning, still today, but uh, because there's a lot of opportunities there, but um, we mostly build libraries that our clients need. So it's not like we're just coming with random ideas, but all of the libraries we open source, uh, we use every day. So one that um, was mentioned in a previous talk was GraphQL code generator. So um, a library that you can actually generate uh, because GraphQL gives you a spec for the schema and queries, uh, you can generate like code for the backend and for the front end for any language. Uh, I think one of the questions was, if, is GraphQL uh, language agnostic uh, in the spec? And it is, it's like GraphQL has nothing to do with any programming language. Like you can use Java, .NET, C, uh, anything. Um, so GraphQL code generator is, uh, it has a lot of different plugins uh, that uh, you could generate. You can build your own generators, basically, very similar to the Swagger Cogen. Uh, so the Swagger Cogen, you have many different plugins. Same thing here, uh, just a bit more powerful because of the nature of GraphQL. I can talk about it a bit later. Uh, we also build a GraphQL inspector, which helps you prevent breaking changes in your API. Uh, that is another very powerful feature of GraphQL. Um, by the way, am I the only one who's hearing static noises or like, is it coming from me? Oh, right. you, can you still hear me? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. I just, mu I just and muted the someone. Noise ah, okay, okay. I think Sorry. it was yeah. someone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And another one, library is GraphQL modules. That was also mentioned in the previous talk, uh, basically that you could like pick parts of your GraphQL schema or data graph, however you want to call it, and then uh, separate it between different teams and create like very explicit dependencies to know which one is relying on what. Um, and the GraphQL tools, um, I'll touch all, about all those different libraries and also GraphQL mesh uh, and others. Like, as you can see, there's a lot of different libraries we, we develop. And again, the idea here is actually, we developed a lot of small libraries that you could gradually use so, you know, they all can work together as one big, 
data platform on the front end or the back end, um, CLI tools and things like that. But you can just pick and choose and gradually buy into this. You don't need to, you know, take everything that we create and, you know, it's all small libraries and open source. And that's part of the goal. Um, so, uh, you know, it was already mentioned a bit about GraphQL, but I'll just give like, you know, a very short sentence about what it is still. Um, I think the best place to do it is instead of like doing slides is just to go to graphql.org because it's a pretty good website, to be honest. Um, and the idea what we see here is like, it's a query language. What do they say here? A query language for API. What does it mean? We can describe here in a schema our data. And the data could be any data. Like it could be a remote call because everything like this, like name or tagline will become a function. So that function can do anything. It can call a database, it can call REST endpoint, uh, and it can even just calculate it's something um, on the browser. So that's that could be any data when you just describe it in a schema, a pretty simple uh, self-explanatory schema. And then you can query it. That's the main difference compared to other, uh, let's say, API technologies. Like most of the API protocols, um, I think GraphQL is not like a completely different thing from them. It's kind of like taking all some of ideas from all the different protocols, but it's also a query language. So the client or the consumer can say, I want, this is what I want. You know, instead of just calling an endpoint or a function on an RPC, whatever you want, here I actually say what I want. And I'm going to get a predictable result. So I'm going to get exactly what I expected to get. And I know the type of the thing that I was querying to. So like we say here, it's a query language for an API. You know, so here's a, you know, a small example. Like you actually can write a query and get just the name and you'll get just the name and the shape is the same. Right, and I get the height, and I get the height, and and I get the right types from it. But also, it could be nested. So, uh, what if I want to query, like, let's say, three different sources that are kind of like have a relationship between them? Um, instead of calling multiple um, requests over the network, I can just send one query and get back one result. Um, so that could be a very powerful thing um, for many reasons: for prefer performance, simplicity. All kinds of things like that. Um, also, you know, the schema is typed. So I know exactly for each field that I'm querying here, I know exactly the type that I'm going to get. And that's why we can have tools like the Cogen uh, that could in advance tell us that we're, you know, we're going to get something and we didn't prepare for it. So it's a very, very powerful tool. You can build a lot of very powerful tools on top of GraphQL. This is one of them, graphical, what you see here. like. You can see that I'm querying an API, like a different server that I have no control of, over, but I have auto completion, um, and I have error handling, and I have description, and I have all these things. Uh, but this is not my code. This is not a, a TypeScript function that is inside my code base. This is something that is completely remote. Uh, and I also get like a whole document thing generated, and not to mention the code gen that I mentioned, and a lot of things. So once you have a spec that is very, um, you know, you have types in it and you have all this, uh, um, you know, it, it, all these things that I mentioned, like uh, you can get a lot of, and build a lot of powerful tools. That's why you saw that we built so many tools around it. It's re relatively easy to build developer tools around GraphQL. Um, and the last thing is what's really interesting about GraphQL is that you could actually evolve your API gradually. You don't need to do versions like V1 or V2. You, because you know, because of the nature of GraphQL that we have a query language and we know what the clients are writing, we can dive more deep into it, you know, uh, if you want to ask about it. We can actually evolve the schema. We don't need to do V1, V2 and a painful migration. We can continuously ship new features and gradually uh, deprecate features without breaking anyone. Facebook has, which invented GraphQL, um, as basically didn't have a breaking change since like 2012 because they have their mobile client, which this is how they, why they invented GraphQL for, 
there are still people around the world that use the first mobile app from Facebook. Like in 2012, those still being used. So they couldn't break the schema. So it's very, very powerful for you to develop uh, GraphQL APIs like that. Um, what you see here is like what someone asked before, like, you know, there's the spec, which is just the schema, but then the implementation could be in any language, right? Like this is the, you know, this is the spec, but then the resolvers, you know, you can write it in TypeScript, you can write it in Java, you can write it in Rust, you know, whatever you want. Um, and of course, there's like basically so many companies today that use uh, GraphQL. So just go to graphql.org. There's like a great, like, I think there's great tutorials there. Like, um, and if not, let me know because we're working and improving it all the time. So that was like the mandatory intro for GraphQL. Um, and I mentioned it before, like, you know, like you instead of multiple calls, like, and instead of like, a lot of round trips to render a page, you can actually send one query and get one result. And also you save the overfetching, like, you know, that you get to an endpoint and instead of getting just what you want, you're gonna get like a whole list of shit that you didn't want. Um, so that's nice. And that's like the two benefits that everyone is talking about when they talk about GraphQL. Um, but I think that GraphQL actually has other benefits. And I think it's more, uh, um, interesting than that. So here, what I'm going to show you is like a bit of how GraphQL works in a very high level. And just to get you to think, um, where are the actual benefits? So what we see here is like, we have a client and we have a data source and let's say the data source is just like rest API and we put the GraphQL engine in between. So that GraphQL engine, we describe the schema of the GraphQL engine, and then we query that GraphQL engine. Um, and we query for a user with a name. So the GraphQL engine will go, uh, will get the user, then gets the user's name and send back the into the client like one uh, result, just like we saw in the website before, with just that specific user and name. And it looks exactly like the query. So I know on the client what I'm going to get. But it's more interesting because if I'm going to get the user with ID two, I want to get the name and the messages. And for each message, I want the content of it. You know, I'll call again one single request. I'm going to fetch the user, then the name and the messages in parallel. And then for each message, maybe the, it's coming from a CMS or something or WordPress. At the end of the day, the client just gets one single response. And all of those things were abstracted away from the client. And that's cool. Um, I want to dive deeper actually into the internals of GraphQL to ask you. Where do you think it fits? So um, kind of like what the first talk demonstrated a bit, you write the schema, but then you also write those resolver functions. Resolver functions are basically like very small functions for each field, like let's say the name, the age. And all they do is just, they know that they're gonna get a certain object from the parent, like let's say the user, user object. Then they need to do some processing, maybe call the network or a REST request and get back a string. That's all. Now, everything, so basically how, what they need to answer is how do I get the user if, how, how do I get the name from the user? Um, now, uh, what you're gonna see in this slide, all of this thing is in the internal, let's call it the internal algorithm of uh, GraphQL. So, while you're looking at this slide, I want you to think where is that code sits today in your app? So the GraphQL function gets those things that we define, the schema and the resolver, and it gets the query. Now what the GraphQL function does, it takes the first box, sends ID 10 into it, and then get the result back. From the result, it's gonna bring the name and the messages boxes, and it's gonna send the value to both of them in parallel and wait for the result. From the name, it got a string, so it puts it in the right place. There's nothing else to do. It validates. Oh, and by the way, it validates everything we're doing as well. That's another thing we can't see here. But then from the messages, we actually get three messages. So then it actually sends for each of these objects, it brings the right boxes in, runs them in parallel, uh, orchestrates and wait for all the responses to get back and then brings us the result as we expect it to happen. 
So all the work that was being done here is being done automatically for you. That's what GraphQL actually does. So, um, you know, so, so when I look at the benefits of GraphQL, I think, yeah, you know, it solves the network for performance and it's meaningful for some, you know, some applications. But I think it's also, it creates basically order in your code base and it automates all the um, data handling and network orchestration in your code base. You don't need to write code for it anymore. You just need to abstract it in the right way and GraphQL will do the work for you. Um, so, you know, I asked you before, where do you think that code fits? And I think what, what we see a lot now is that the people that start with GraphQL are actually front-end developers. Because what's happening in a lot of applications today is that this work that I just showed you is being happening on the front end. So the app is actually querying the server, the REST APIs, and then it waits for all the different responses to come. And then when all the responses arrived, now we're gonna iterate over all these values and to just extract the data that we need and to construct it in the right shape so we can send it to our UI components or to our you know, native UI components, whatever application we're using. So all this work, we can now automate. So what we thought when we come to a, you know, a large company or a company with a lot of existing code, what we think is instead of now caring about the network performance, which you know, it's important, but nobody really cares uh, at the beginning, why won't we just automate all of this the work that we do manually on the client, let's just put GraphQL, the GraphQL server or the GraphQL engine, or how we I call it the GraphQL function, let's just put it on the client. So let's take all that work that we used to do before manually and do it automatically and start there. And I think there you will see like all the different benefits that you can have without now needing to convince um, you know, all the different architects why GraphQL is the best thing ever. Now it's just another library you install, an NPM library you install in your front end and it's done. Uh, and you can delete a bunch of code that you write today manually. And later when you, after you did that and you've proved it works, now you can just take the same logic, the same box, automation box, orchestration box, and you can move it to the server. And I think then, like, I'm not going to dive too much deep into that, but then it's also a lot of common questions that come. If you think like that and start like that, a lot of common questions around GraphQL on how you do auth and how you do security, suddenly the, the answers becomes more simple because you've done it before on the client. So, you know, so it gives you a certain context of what it actually does and what it's not supposed to do. Um, yeah. Um, Okay, uh, let me skip a bit. Um, and, you know, like in the talk before and like uh, I mentioned now, let's let's say, you know, I, I'm not going to do like a very basic GraphQL uh, talk here, but again, feel free to ask questions. But I'm going to show you some advanced things uh, and then, you know, you can ask more questions. So let's say I convince you all that GraphQL is great between the client and the uh, you know, uh, between the client and the backend services. And that's actually what's happening. Like usually it's very easy to convince like the front end developers to use GraphQL because it's great. Um, but then once, you know, it comes into, into the, into the uh, organization and people start to see how fast they develop with this thing, the backend developers are like, oh, wait a second, maybe it's not such a bad idea. Maybe I can look into that as well. What should I do on the backend? Um, and, you know, how can we take like the cool stuff from GraphQL and could we or should we use them also on the backend services? And one thing that a lot of like GraphQL enthusiasts are doing is like, okay, they, let's migrate all of our backend services into GraphQL. Or let's, you know, write like a proxies between all the different GraphQL, all different existing uh, backend services and, um, and, and just do everything GraphQL. And that's cool, but you know, in real world, um, you know, it's not, it's not, I think it's like unreal. Like there's people have enough work as is. And um, 
you never have time to like do so many transformations, especially if you haven't even proved it's actually good for you yet. But the thing is, um, we thought we still saw the benefits. So we still thought, how can we still leverage it also in places that don't have time for it? And the thing is, we have on the back end, you know, we have other technologies, right? Like uh, SOAP, Swagger, Open API, gRPC, uh, OData, all kinds of cool stuff. Um, also, we have the documentation that is still there, like those services are running and also maybe live data and logs, like we can look at what's actually happening there and we can have information. So what we thought was like, could we get some of the benefits of GraphQL, but from all the information that we already have today? And it took me back to another idea that we used to do before. I'm not going to dive too much deep into it, even though we built it for a company in Holland as well. Um, we build, uh, we used to have like a, in a company in Holland, we used to have a gateway and it served like one type of client, but then another type of client, they didn't want to do GraphQL. They wanted to do REST still. They didn't. So I thought, well, if GraphQL is actually a superset of REST, maybe I can just generate from an existing GraphQL endpoint, I can actually generate REST endpoints super quickly. And that's what we did, and that's SOFA. Uh, that's another library we created. But this time we thought the opposite. Maybe we have all those existing sources that are on the back end, they're behind. Um, the GraphQL service is actually querying them. Um, what could we do with that? So what we thought was maybe we can take these sources and, and their schemas, their existing information, whatever we have from it, and then generate from that actually GraphQL schemas. And that's uh, one part of a library that we created that's called GraphQL Mesh. GraphQL Mesh is basically, we query anything, run anywhere. So let's talk about the query anything. So we can take with GraphQL Mesh, we can take any existing service with whatever protocol it has. We have handlers for Open API Swag or gRPC, SOAP, uh, or even SQL, um, and all data that we work with Microsoft on it. And we can take that and we can actually generate GraphQL out of it. So we can leverage the existing services we have, but then from the consumer perspective, suddenly we get this cool um, developer experience as if it was GraphQL. So that's pretty cool. That's one phase. We take all those different sources and automatically without the developer needing to, we can generate GraphQL out of that automatically. But then we have different sources, many different sources in GraphQL. Maybe we can now take all those different things we, man we, we generate and merge that into one schema. So now we can actually, let's say we send a query in GraphQL and that query has fields from some service that is open API, some service that is JSON schema, and some service that is SQL or gRPC. But I don't know, and it was all being generated for me. I didn't need to write manual code for it. Uh, the merging strategy, you know, there's two very famous ones. One is like uh, Apollo Federation, and the other one is schema stitching. Um, we you can ask me about later what I think is better. Um, I'll skip that for now um, because I want to get to questions. But the last thing we said, GraphQL Mesh is um, query anything, run anywhere. Now, the thing is what I could do is I could take all those different sources and I can generate this like, let's say central point that anyone can query anything. It will go to the central point, get the data that I want and give that to me which is okay, but central point is also like, it's a point of failure. Um, so what we said was maybe we could take, take this generation process and then generate, let's say like a unified schema that we can execute, but then we can not only generate a server from it, we can actually even generate SDKs from it. So now we can give the developers an experience like they were querying someplace um, central that has all the information, but under the hood, this is actually an SDK that runs completely distributedly. And this is why it's called mesh because all the services can call each other instead of going to a central point. Um, but it feels as easy as if it was just one place that has all my data. 
Um, I'm going to skip this part. Um, Great. Uh, this really is... good round it up. It would be nice. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I'm going to skip all of this. And I think we can get into questions because all of the rest is more advanced. We have um, a few questions, so that's nice. Yeah. So, so I'll close this for now and let's do questions. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, thank you. And if you have a link about your PowerPoint, that's also fine. Uh, then we can look at it in the end. Uh, yes. That's great. Uh, you can share that with us. Um, well, first of all, thank you. I would say that <laughs> in the beginning mm -hmm. before before we go to the questions. I really like the slides as well. They were very, very easy to follow for me, actually. I don't know a lot about GraphQL, but I really liked it. Uh, it showed really this good perspective for the backend uh, as well. That was nice that you talked about that indeed. Uh, so please give it up for uh, Yuri with some uh, cool emoticons as well. That's always cool to see. And uh, then we can go to the questions. Uh, so I already saw four questions and somebody had really good timing. So uh, we will start with the one of the good timing. What do you think about uh, schema stitching from GraphQL tools versus mm -hmm. Apollo Federation? Uh, you are kind of expected that question already, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. Um... I think Apollo, Feder Apollo Federation um, is something that Apollo uses. First of all, I would say one very important thing, you probably don't need any of them. So, um, you know, you just saw the talk before me, um, like uh, um, he used GraphQL modules. And that just GraphQL modules, which means I can separate the different parts of my schema between different teams or however I want to separate it, but then the merging is done at build time. And then I get one simple GraphQL endpoint that is more performant. That's the best solution out there, right? Like don't scale before you need to scale. Like don't don't <laughs> try, uh, so most likely you don't need these two things. That's That's the most important thing, but you start to getting into this area of schema stitching and Apollo Federation, we call it remote execution. Why? Because it means that you hit this, let's say, gateway that is one GraphQL endpoint. Then that GraphQL endpoint will call other services that are also GraphQL. So first of all, what you've done there is now you have two points of GraphQL. So that's inherently <laughs> slower, right? So it gives you the benefits of all these will run individually and you can write them all in different languages. Like you can have parts of the gateway being Python, part of the gateway being Java, part of them being Node. So that's the benefits of it. But, mo but don't forget, this is only the gateway. This is not your services. Like you can have your gateway as a monolith gateway that will call your microservices. So don't jump into this area anyway, I think too early. But if you do, um, Apollo Federation has its own, it's very opinionated and it has its own uh, spec. And um, it's, it's, you have to use Apollo for it. Like this is kind of like, and that's kind of like also their goal. They want to make money and they want you to buy into that ecosystem. Schema stitching started as, um, and Apollo said they are deprecating schema stitching because they wanted to take Apollo Federation because it's better for their business. We took over schema stitching and brought it back to life. And ever since then, what you can get now is basically you can think of schema stitching as a superset of abilities compared to Apollo Federation. Because um, first of all, schema stitching is just GraphQL. It does the same thing that Apollo Federation does without introducing something that is not GraphQL. So you can take any GraphQL service and that GraphQL service will run um, the schema stitching no matter what service it is. So that's important. So you're not locking in yourself into a certain uh, ecosystem and you're still just doing GraphQL. And the other thing is that now recently, uh, if you look at our blog, we released uh, GraphQL tools version eight and schema stitching version eight. Now you can actually schema stitching can manage Apollo Federation services. So you can basically take your, uh, let's say you're even already now are using Apollo Federation, which you're buying into that ecosystem, you can't leave. Now you can just replace the top part, Apollo Gateway, and put schema stitching into it. And now it will just work. And now you can start changing gradually your services into just 
whatever technology you want. Uh, so I personally think that schema stitching is better, but uh, again, <laughs> I'm biased, so just know that. Um, but yeah, nice that's my comment. opinion. <laughs> <laughs> nice comment, uh, Yuri. Thank you for answering that question. There are three more questions and then we'll round it up. Uh, mm -hmm. So. The other question is, so if a GraphQL is strong on predictability, does it also empower smart, fast caching? Um, very, very good question. Yes. Um, so cache, well, caching is, uh, is a complicated um, area because, because you can do it in many different levels. Um, for example, in the previous talk, uh, you mentioned caching on the client side, which is very, very powerful. Like what you can do basically, because you have um, the schema being exposed, you can basically build like a mini database on your client. And that's what Apollo Client does or Oracle or Relay, like all the GraphQL clients. And that means that if like a database, if two, um, let's say two components are sharing the same data, they would hit this um, browser database first and might just reuse the same data, which is, which is nice. Um, there's also caching on the server side. Um, I will just, so I think if I need to give a general quick answer, I would say GraphQL um, might not fit into the traditional tools of caching. And that meant that for many years, caching with GraphQL was a bit harder, but now because of all kinds of new tools, GraphQL is not on, with the new tools, GraphQL is actually more powerful because you can do more things with GraphQL that, and caching that you could do with, uh, that you did with uh, regular REST because again, the biggest difference between REST and GraphQL is that the server or the provider has the knowledge of what the consumer wants. So just even hypothetically think about what you could do if you had this information. Um, so that's the biggest difference. So also in caching, you can cache more smartly if you know what your consumer actually needs. Um, yeah, wow. and there's now more and more solutions for it. I'll maybe I'll post a link for a new library that we just released that made a lot of noise that uh, made the, that makes it all these things much uh, simpler. That's great to hear. All right, last two questions. Uh, a quick summary is also fine for the questions and we can dive deeper into that uh, later if you want. Um, mm -hmm. But first question then, uh, when a property is removed, renamed or moved, it's still removed, right? Uh, that seems like a breaking change. How do you catch that? Uh, wait, again, again, when a property is- It's removed, um, renamed or moved. Ah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, great question. So the question is basically, um, how can you prevent breaking changes? Um, so first of all, I would say you need to, I would put some process in place to make sure that you're not doing it, right? So um, in our case, it's like um, there's GraphQL Inspector, which is like, uh, you know, it's a tool that basically runs in your CI and tells you that, hey, this change is a breaking change. Now, the question is, how can I avoid this breaking change? So in, in GraphQL, what you do is that, like the way to avoid it, um, I mean, you can still break uh, your API with GraphQL, you just have other options, why? Because let's say you want to rename something. So instead of renaming it, what you would do, you will just introduce a new field with the new name. Right now, instead of waiting for all your clients and your servers to be deployed at the same time and moved at the same time, which would never happen, especially not if you have mobile applications, um, what you would do is you will just introduce the new name that will direct to the same function that you had before. Now, but then what you will do, you will start to track your live uh, data. Uh, you will check two things. First of all, all your source code to queries. So you know with GraphQL Inspector, Inspector, if you run it on your source code, you can see which fields are not being queried at all. So that's first of all information that you couldn't have with REST because you don't know what was like what was being queried. Second of all, this is not enough because there's also live clients out there that are querying the same field. So the second thing you can do is you can start collecting 
You're in, Sorry? It, so, so it does come down to managing your property still, right? There is no, there of is no magical thing that that happens <laughs> to prevent it. Uh, that's the, the the reason for the. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, you just of course, like, yeah, 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 yeah. There's no of course, a graph in software. Well. There's no magic. There's no magic <laughs> in software. But there's a. That's uh, a good quote. <laughs> just like uh, you could, it's more explicit. So you could um build um, tools that will guard you and help you with it. Yes, you're right. Like there's no magic here. Like what I'm saying is like, you know, because of that query, the, the power, the fact that you know these queries, um, your insights into how every field is being used is much more powerful. So it makes the deprecation process much easier until a point where it completely changes how you think about APIs, like how you deprecate things and, and you just maybe not, you never break. You have another tool called GraphQL Hive that is like, um, sorry that I'm like um, putting links and stuff. It's just because it's like for the- Sharing the links is fine. Sharing knowledge yeah. is the way you, there is to uh, here, of course. But it, this is like basically taking the live data that you have looking at the live data and then seeing, oh, so nobody queried that field live in the last 30 days. Now I can remove it. <laughs> now it's safe. Yeah. But, but with REST, you couldn't do it because maybe people are still querying that REST endpoint, but you don't know if they're using all the fields or not. You know, so you, you, you have to basically look at everything or nothing in REST. All right, interesting. Uh, let's go to the last question and then uh, we'll round it up. Uh, thank you for your answers so far, Yuri. They're really uh, <laughs> extensive and great, to be honest. <laughs> so that's good. Um, last question, would you recommend one backend API endpoint when using GraphQL, um, for instance, REST, or does it not matter if using multiple backend services? Um, so uh, again, like if if I would, I would post the question in the chat again, so uh, you okay. can read it for yourself. Maybe that's uh, a bit better. <laughs> would you recommend uh, one backend API endpoint when using GraphQL? Ah, like if you would do it. It's from Tom Cool. So maybe if Tom Cool wants to uh, put his microphone on, then he can explain as well. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Nice. <clears throat> so for for REST, for security reasons, you would probably mm. choose one endpoint to talk to other endpoints, right? So mm. that's to 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 uh, secure the front end, actually, and also the the the, mm. the talking to the back end. So it does it? My experience with GraphQL is not that much. So is that the same kind of strategy you would choose, or? Mm. Um, it's a good question. I think. Well, I guess. Um, there's few, let, let's separate authentication and authorization. So yeah. first thing is um, you want to um, authenticate, you know, the request. So you want to know who this person is. So, you know, that you do before everything, I think, and that has nothing to do with GraphQL. Um, yeah. However you did authentication before, you can still do it. Now, how you do authorization, I think the, how I see the best practice is that if you have multiple services, each service should, should be responsible for its own authorization. Why do I say that? Because I think uh, two reasons. One, I think authorization has is, is always connected to the business logic, right? Like, you know, the reason I separated something into a microservice is because this is like a domain knowledge. And that domain knowledge also knows who is... Uh, who can access what in my domain? But that's a micro uh, the second object, thing, right? Exactly, and then and then also like th that means that if my gateway is for some reason insecure or somehow someone managed to penetrate my gateway, my services are still um, secure, right? I'm not putting all my security in one place, and then um, and and also that one place. If I would put the authorization there, now that place is again like a central place that needs to know all the domain knowledge to know which across all the different services to know who can access what. So I would always say 
Well, not always, because again, like I said, there's no magic in software and there's no uh, right answer. But but let's say like in, in a, I, I would say that in most cases, if I'm in a services world, I would try to push authorization on the services level. And that means that GraphQL is actually acts like a dumb router. So let's say I have I have a query. I know who this I, I before GraphQL I did an auth authentication. So I into that query I added a header that specifies who this person is. And now I'm sending that header to all to three services because the query needs like let's say fields from three different services. Now let's say two services are fine. The third service says you don't have you can't access this information. Mm. What GraphQL does compared to REST is instead of sending you, and people are getting angry at it for some reason, instead of sending one response that says, you know, with HTTP code like 200, 400, 500, whatever, it will send you partial results. It will tell you here is the data of the things you are authorized for, and here is now and the reason why you didn't get access to these fields. And then as the front-end developer or the product developer, you can decide, do I want, because it's, I think it's a product choice, if I have partial data, do I want to keep on going or I want to fail everything? But it's not, I think it's not for the services decision, it's for the product decision. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I uh, went into the right direction <laughs> there, but... Uh, no, I could follow you fine. So, <laughs> I like the right yeah, I like the answer. Yeah, it's for me. It's the, the conceptual thing. Is I'm I'm way into rest. I'm way into front end. So this is a new concept for me. Yeah. But I like the way how you explain it. So I, I think it's not. I think there's nothing. Again, there's nothing new here. Like everything you could you could theoretically think theoretically and not theoretically. By the way, also you can look at old data, for example, which means you can build all these things using rest. Um, but because this is a spec and a standard, you could yeah. automate more of it. And it also, I think, organizes these thoughts better. And I think some people, even though I'm like a very GraphQL enthusiast, I think just like, let's say in these areas, I don't think GraphQL should redefine what was working before, right? Like a lot of people are putting on the schema, they put the, um, the authorization information on the schema. Um, but that again means that let's say if someone, you know, that you have a central place that handles that, and I'm not sure it's the right way, even though it's like cool. Um, yeah, that's the yeah. That, that's the danger. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your question. Thank you, Tom, Thank you for, uh, for uh, speaking up. <laughs> that's great. Good questions. Yeah, really good questions. Yes, nice. Uh, I will uh, create an ending to our uh, very good line talks. Then we'll answer the last question, of course, but let's do that uh, behind the scenes, so to say. Um, thank you all for this great session. I really like the interactiveness. That's also why we uh, were a bit delayed. Sorry for that. Uh, but I think if we're all having a great time, then it's no problem, of course. Please help us with filling in the feedback form. That would be really lovely. So you can put your ideas in that. If you want to present as well, you can always contact the meetup organizers. That's also cool. And you can actually win a prize. You already see the questions here on the side. So we don't ask you for a name. We don't ask you for an email unless you want to win a prize. Of course, we need contact details for that. Um, so please look into that and then we can improve for all of us. Um, last small announcement again, the 14th of September, JavaScript and frameworks, uh, yeah, basically a lightning talk from Sosti and Frontmania. We will do it a bit different then, uh, but with the same concept. And I hope to see you guys at the next lightning talks. Then we can stop the recording and chat about the last question. And thank you all for being here. Um, so yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Have a great day or evening.